Okay, so today we're going to cover how to maybe manage first drafts on our early letter forms project for typography class. So to share with you some files, I'm on the desktop and I'm going to go and connect to server, which is command K. And I have a server address as SMB semicolon two forward slashes INS dash TECH. Any extraneous information you want to delete that before you hit the connect. Now at home you won't be able to do this, so this is something you would have to do in the classroom. So I'm going to hit connect. And it's going to ask me which volume that I want to have mounted. And I have my stuff on the VizCom drive. Um, so when that pops up, I will scroll down and choose VizCom. Then I hit the OK button. And I should get a big window that opens up here really soon. Now, these folders typically are in alphabetical order. If yours looks like this, which is the larger uh, icon view, um, I would rather you just list it as um, the names and it puts it automatically in alphabetical order. So there's different ways to view things. Um, this just makes it quick and easy and you know everything's alphabetized. So if you click on the Bilberry folder and double click on that, it will open. It's kind of slow, but because we're all trying to probably go to the same place. It will pop up here shortly. We're clearly having some slow network things today. Um, inside of the Bilberry folder you'll see in all caps the word typography. Now I have a couple of folders there. Um, the one that says Project 1 Early Letter Forms, ignore that for just a moment and go to the one that says Rebecca Bilberry Project 1 and feel free to drag that to your desktop. Again, this would be the Rebecca Bilberry Project 1 folder. This is just so if you wanted to play with the things that I'm playing with. You want to mess with the type or whatever. What that folder should have is it should have the font I'm using, which I will share with you how I got that, images I might be using for this, and my body copy. Okay? So those are the things I have in my folder so far that I've collected for this project. Now before we get too far into this, let's talk about the fonts. You guys are allowed to use the following fonts on this project. Garamond, which is an old style classification font. Baskerville, which is a transitional classification. You'll learn about these classifications later. Badoni, which is considered a modern classification font. Modern not in the sense it was created recently. It was just at the time these were going through this transition, it was considered modern at the time. So that's Badoni. The next one is Century Expanded, which falls within the Egyptian classification. Um, Egyptian and Slab Serif are, happened about the same time. A uh, Century uh, Expanded is is not uh, Egyptian or it's not Slab Serif. It's Egyptian. It doesn't look like it came from Egypt, though. The Egyptian classification is kind of weird. It was it's a classification that was invented during the uh, exhumation of King Tut's tomb, which was a big giant world event. So that's why they call that classification Egyptian. They're fonts that were created during that time. They look nothing like Egyptian hieroglyphics or anything. The last classification would be um, uh, sans serif, which that font for that one is Helvetica. So again, it's Garamond, Baskerville, Bodoni, Century, Century Expanded, I believe. I need to probably look at the project sheet just to make sure I'm not saying the wrong thing. And the last one is Helvetica. These are the ones you can use, yes. Century Expanded, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I'm looking at the project sheet. Garamond, Baskerville, Bodoni, Century Expanded, or Helvetica. Unless you're like our, our guy from New Jersey who has decided to possibly hand letter some stuff. If he wants to. So if you want to hand letter, and it looks awesome and it goes with it, that's one way of working around getting, getting out of using these as your uh, body or as your main copy. Body copy should definitely uh, probably be set with one of these. Okay. Now, how do you get these fonts? Well, let me share with you two ways. If you're working at home, you can go to Blackboard, and I have supplied you with the entire collection of Viscom fonts that we own. Now, keep in mind, you do not own these fonts. You may use them for educational purposes only. You would not want to 
um, use these as uh, things that you uh, make money off of or your freelance work. So I'm going to log in to the Blackboard and I'm going to show you where to get these. I would suggest that you copy them to your hard drive but do not load them, meaning activating them. If you activate them all at the same time, your computer will crash. So uh, unless you have some really good font management software. So I'm going to go to our typography folder. And in the resources area, assuming you are away from school and you don't have access to all these fonts, in the resources area, I have included, usually it's near the bottom. Let me find it. Here it is. It's three items up from the bottom. Fonts for educational use only. And it describes how um, there are some legal issues with fonts if you don't own them. And then it discusses how you might load a font on either a Mac or a PC. And then if I click on the underlined link, which is a folder, I do have a zipped file right here that has all of those fonts. Now you, to download that, you would right click, save the link as. I usually take it to my desktop and save it. And since it's zipped, let me minimize that since it's still downloading right now. That's why it has an X and there's a little progress bar. Also, I have a video for those of you guys who would like to watch how to load fonts. There's a video there. But right now it's still downloading because there are over 2,000 font files here in one zip folder. That's a lot of fonts. And you guys are going, mmm, yummy, 2,000 fonts. That's not 2,000 typefaces. Each typeface may have anywhere from 3 to 20 different styles of that particular typeface design. Bold, italic, uh, extra black, uh, extended, expanded, uh, condensed, condensed bold, condensed bold, italic. Those are all styles. So uh, if I'm at home, I can just simply double click or right click on this and tell it to expand and it will expand into uh, a folder that will then be named fonts organized by name. If you double click on this, you'll see there's a display fonts folder, a sans serif, and a serif. Um, serif fonts would include Garamond, Baskerville, and Bodoni, and Century expanded. So we, these are in alphabetical order. So here's Garamond, and there are a few different styles of Garamond. Interna it's different type foundries. International Typeface did Garamond. The Stimple Type Foundry did Garamond, and Linotype did Garamond. So those are three different type foundries or type manufacturers. That's why there's three different ones. They're slightly different from one another. All Garamonds and all Helveticas are not created equally. But Garamond is in there. If I'm looking for um, Baskerville, which is the transitional font we're allowed to use, it's in here. Uh, Bodoni, which is the modern font, it is also in here. And since Century Expanded, which is the uh, Egyptian font, is in there. Those are all serif typefaces. They have the finishing strokes. The Romans invented that. I don't know what happened, why they ended up with a finishing stroke, but they're the ones who are accredited to that. Sans serif typefaces are here in the sans serif. That means without a serif, without that finishing little stroke. And we do have Helvetica. We have Helvetica New, which I would probably choose because Helvetica New has so many options. Helvetica New, oh, somebody accidentally parked Helvetica rounded in there. Helvetica New has over 27 varieties to choose from. So you want to keep some unity yet have some uh, difference within something. Helvetica New is not a bad typeface. Helvetica Rounded, I would not normally use that for much of anything, but that's just me. I'm not, I don't think I've ever used Helvetica Rounded. It's not, to me, as attractive as some other typefaces. So we probably need to move Helvetica Rounded out of there and put it in its own place. Display fonts are cool, awesome things, but you are not allowed to use them on the uh, this project. They are things that looked hand generated, look like they might have been done with a calligraphy pen or a marker. Some of them look Western or uh, look as if they came from the circus or come from the Western days uh, when, you know, gun smoke and all that was going on. So those typefaces, we're going to reserve those for another time. Okay, but they are there in the, in the event that you need to use them for something else. All right. Now, how do you load the font? You are probably wondering once you get it. Let's say I am going to use, for my body copy, I will choose, um, maybe I'll choose the transitional, I will use Baskerville. I'm going to drag Baskerville to my desktop, okay, or drag it to your flash drive or wherever. 
Um, to load this font the wrong way, <laughs> I want to teach you guys industry professional stuff, but at foam, you, at home, at foam, at home, you do not have font management software the way we have it here. And if you guys are working in the professional world, they will have font management software more than likely. So let me show you the wrong way or the way I might do it at home because I can't afford the expensive software. If I t simply double click on the Baskerville folder and then double click on each one of these fonts, font files, I can click install font and it will install it and be ready to use. It will not uninstall it when I restart the machine or anything like that. So you have to kind of keep track of what fonts you've installed when, maybe in a paper ledger, because if your computer starts acting like it has a virus shortly after you've loaded fonts, you may have an issue called a font conflict. You may have loaded all sorts of really cool free fonts and have all these crazy neat fonts on your machine, and all of a sudden you're loading those professional grade fonts, and you may have a professional grade font that has the same font ID number as the free one you got from defont.com. And your computer doesn't know what to do, so it acts like it has a virus and it won't start up right. It'll just keep on crashing on you and it just goes nuts. So keep a ledger or a log of the font, and not on your computer because you can't get to it if it's acting this way. It sounds old school, but keep a paper ledger, a little notebook of what fonts you've loaded and when, and if your computer starts acting them up, then you can unload those fonts or uninstall them. Now, what do we use to avoid that issue? We use a thing called uh, Suitcase Fusion. At the bottom of our dock, and you will probably not have this at home, this is third-party software, it's not an Adobe product, we can click on Suitcase Fusion 4, and this is font management software that you may, uh, I'm going to hit no thanks on this, that you may see being used at a job that you might have when you get out there. They don't have time to figure out font issues and why the computer is trying to crash. Time is money. If they're trying to spend hours trying to solve a problem, that means they're not getting any work done. So this is why we use things like Suitcase Fusion, font management software, so that we can quickly turn on and off fonts. We can load them and then activate them, and we can quickly turn them on and off depending on what project we're working on. So how do we use this? Well, I'm going to just drag the folder Baskerville to the lower empty area here, the window, and actually on my project one, I was actually going to use Helvetica New. I'll grab that and drag him. These are copied, but they are not activated. So I can, I can copy all of my fonts to suitcase. And I asked IT to do this, but they couldn't figure it out. So it would be nice to have them already loaded like this, and then all you have to do is activate them. So we have to both load them and activate them. So I have it loaded, but if I go to the software, you will not see Baskerville uh, STD or Helvetica STD. You will not see them. You won't see the Lion type versions of those. You'll see a true type version or some other version that came with the software. Well, I don't want to use those. I want to use these. To activate these, underneath the little circle next to the star to the left, you'll see that a little yellow light kind of turns on. When I click on that, it turns blue. Now the fonts are becoming activated. You can see it down at the bottom. It was going through them. Let me deactivate and I'll do this again. When I click here, if you look at the bottom, it will run through and show you they're activated. Well, it did, I'll just do this one. Since it already did it, it won't do it again. Helvetica rounded. There we go. So it's going through and just that one didn't have as many. If it's a thing like Helvetica new and there's a whole bunch of font files in there, it'll tell you that it's activating it down here and when it's done, it'll turn that off. But again, Helvetica new has so many in there. All right, so I have to do this every time I come here. You guys get kind of a little bit out of shape because you come in and you're like, hey, that font I was using yesterday, it's no longer on here. I'm like, yep, you have to load it every time. Why is that? Well, we have this little beautiful little thing up here. It looks like a polar bear. That's called deep freeze. And Anytime we load software on the computer, when, it's, when you log out or when it's restarted, all that goes away. And the reason why was people were loading questionable software on these computers. Questionable meaning we had all sorts of stuff going on that needed to not go on. So this allows it to clean it up. Now at home, once you load a font, it's loaded until you unload it or deactivate it. Okay, so that's how you load fonts in the classroom in Suitcase Fusion. You will have to do this every time you sit down and work on your project, okay?
and then a lot of people don't realize that they get a little bent out of shape when it doesn't work for them um, when they open their file all their stuff will be pink in in uh, oh uh, in InDesign the, the stuff turns pink you type now let's talk about InDesign I'm going to open InDesign and this is Creative Cloud what I'm going to show you will also work as far back as version CS6. So if you are working with older software, what I'm about ready to discuss will work for everything. If you get a startup alert, just hit no several times. It's about some sort of plug-in issue that they've not been able to figure out. So we're just hitting no on those. We have not had any problems related to those so far. So just hit no. And then we'll get it open. Now, you guys do not want to create uh, eight and a half by 11 inch documents. One, this is a 10 inch by 10 inch um, format. And 10 inches does not fit comfortably within eight and a half inches. So when you ha when somebody gives you a document size, make that uh, document in InDesign the actual size that it's supposed to be, not the paper size it's going to print on. So if we have two sizes of paper in the printer, we have eight and a half by 11, we have 11 by 17. Which one are we going to print on? 11 by 17. Because 10 inches fits comfortably within 11 inches and the 17 inches. So we're going to create a new document. So that would be File, New, Document. Now, I am a keyboard shortcut junkie. So the keyboard short shortcut for new in any Adobe software is on a Mac, Command N, on a PC, Control N. Now it says new document. This is a print document. It's not an ebook or anything else. So we're going to print it. You want to turn facing pages off because we are not doing a book. And where it says paper size, letter, we don't even pull from that drop down menu because we're just going to type in the width and the height that we're going to need to use. Now this is a measurement here that many of you are not familiar with. 51 P0. What that means is 51 pica zero points. Type is measured in points and picas. So that's why that odd looking measurement. What you guys can type in here is 10 and I the, the letters I N for inches and it will automatically convert this to 60 picas which is 10 inches. If there's six picas in an inch that converts to 60 picas. Now the orientation really does not really matter here because it's a square. So it doesn't matter if we're doing portrait or landscape, so we can leave that alone. The number of columns. Um, there's a great book on grids that I'd like to show you. It's in my office and um, it's, it, it discusses how to use columns and grid structures. So I'll share that with you face to face here. But I do want you to know that the fewer the columns, the less um, flexibility you have in a layout. The fewer columns as far as aligning things to the columns. The more columns you have, the more flexibility you have. So I typically will go with error, error on the side of a little bit generous. So let's say I'm going to do six columns just to give me plenty of room to align elements and move them around and kind of get some sort of structure. Now you can choose four columns, five columns, six columns, eight columns. I'm just starting with six. It's just a nice number where I can get, I can get three. I can do three column layout in a six column grid where I go across two of the columns. I can, I can get a lot of variety here. Now where it says margins, three pica is equivalent to a half an inch since there's six picas in an inch, three picas is a half an inch. I'm okay with a half inch margin. What this margin represents is thumb space on the outside of the page. You still print in that area. It's also a safety margin that basically means don't put your text past this area, your body copy specifically. Now I do want to talk about bleed. Slug is not so important. If I click on the arrow next to bleed and slug, a bleed is, um, a thing that we use whenever you have designed right to the edge of the page and you want your image to, or a color bar or anything to go right to the edge of the page, we actually have it go to the edge of the page and a little beyond. The part that is beyond the edge of the page is known as the bleed. 
This makes it easier for you when you're trimming out the project. If you are slightly off, nobody's going to know because there's still image or color out there. So I always set the bleed at an eighth of an inch, which is nine points, so P9. Not nine picas. Nine picas is an inch and a half. So my bleed is P9. If you were to type in 0.125 IN, if you're more of like, a, well, 0.125 inches is an eighth of an inch, and I hit the tab key, well, it converts to P9, nine points. Zero pica, nine points. The slug is just area that you can put information if you're sending this off to a professional printer and you need to make sure there's some sort of red alert thing about some color you're using, a special color, you can put it out there. That way, while it's on press, people can see that and they're like, oh, wait, this color plate is for the special metallic ink because we can't really do metallics here very easily. So I'm going to hit OK. And we will have a 10 inch by 10 inch, six column layout, half an inch margins with a eighth of an inch bleed on the outside. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six columns. The space between the columns is called a gutter. Old school people might call it the alley. This area outside of the pink line is called the margin area. You can design in there. I highly urge you to let larger graphics, maybe even bigger type or something go out in there. Body copy should never go outside the pink lines. The red line indicates how far we're going to pull the bleed if we have something going off to the edge of the page. The black line indicates the actual edge of the page. So anything that goes up to the black line will be printed and is part of your design. A lot of people get confused and think that they only design to the pink line. And so I'm always asking, did you mean to have a white border around your entire design? No, I did not. Well, that means you need to design to the black line, okay? Now, when I said you can make a six column grid, a three column grid, let me show you what I mean. I'm just going to simply use what's called the rectangle tool to indicate maybe a copy box. So I'm gonna draw across two columns I'll just fill it with black. And what this is, let me make sure it's snug in there. What this is, it's a one column sort of thing. I can put text in there. But it breaks the grid in that it goes across two columns. So if I were to copy this, and I'm just holding down the Alt key, which also is the Option key on the Mac. If I were to copy this and drag it, the Alt key is copy and paste and it pastes it exactly where you tell it versus, I don't use much Command C, Command V, or Control C, Control V anymore now that that Alt key is there. But here we can envision, oh, three columns of text on a six column grid. Now the cool thing about a six column grid is that you can also go across three columns and have a two column grid like this. Now, if you're wondering how I got rid of the lines, that's by hitting the W key. Think of W as what you see is what you get. This would be what I would get if I printed right now. This is my working view. Working view or what you see is what you get. Okay, so there's a little bit about grids. Now, let's say that you wanted some things to line up. Now these are naturally lining because, I'm. Hit, by the way, I'm deleting these. These are naturally aligning because they're the same box just copied across the, the, the grid. But let's say you were trying to line some things up and you weren't copying and pasting. In the rulers, both at the top and the side, you can click and you can pull down grid lines. This is known as a horizontal grid. Now you cannot build by default uh, with a click of a button. Like you can't tell in design, hey, I want a horizontal grid split six ways. We have to build those. So if you have an alignment that you'd like to go horizontal, you can pull a grid line down for that. If you want to get rid of that grid line, just pull it back up or click on it and hit the delete key, assuming the line is not locked. Now, if you wanted to lock a grid line because you accidentally keep clicking on it and moving it, you would go to view, grids and guides, and lock the guides. Again, that was view, grids and guides, and lock. Now you'll notice I can click on this and nothing's happening. I can't delete it, I cannot move it. 
So if you, again, wanted to unlock that, it would be View, Grids and Guides. And now uncheck the Lock Guides, and it will be unlocked. And I can click on it, and I can delete it. Okay? So that's the basics of Grids. I could go into a lot more on Grids. I mean, we could have little pictures in here that were... Cool thing about a grid is you can go, oh, I need a little picture here of somebody, and I need another f image uh, over here. And the nice thing about InDesign, it kind of lets you know when things are lined up. So I need a picture going all the way across here like so. And it's just really easy to get a sense of unity and alignment using a grid. And again, the more columns you have, the more flexibility you have in being able to cross over columns. This is why I'm using a six column grid. I can have as something as small as one column or as wide as six columns or as wide as two or three columns. I can have an asymmetrical thing. I can have a symmetrical thing. It gives me a lot of flexibility. If I only had a two column grid, I wouldn't have a whole lot to work with. Let me hit the W key. All right, so now we understand a little bit about the grid. Let's talk about how to use it with real elements, such as typography, and images. Now, I oftentimes like to use layers. Many of you have become accustomed to using those in Photoshop or Illustrator. Uh, the layer one would be the bottommost layer. Uh, right now I have nothing on there. If I click on the new layer button, I can make a layer two and a layer three and so on. But layer one will be on the bottom. You can rename these layers by double clicking on them. I might call this my background. So now I have a background layer. I might call layer two my images layer. And layer three might be my copy layer or text type, let's just say, because that's what's called in our assignment. So when I'm working on any of these layers, I want to make sure I'm on the right layer. And I, I know you're never on the right layer in Photoshop. You always have to move things around. I, I, I'm always on the wrong layer. How many of you guys are always on the wrong layer? I hate that, don't you? It's going to happen here, too. But I'm going to share with you how to, how to uh, deal with that um, after you forget you're on the wrong layer. So I'm going to go on the background layer. I'm on purpose going to be on the wrong layer when I place my text, okay? So how do we place text? Well, I have my text in a folder on the desktop, so I know where it is. First off, you have to know where your text is. For you guys, it might be on your flash drive. So to place text, I'm going to go to File and place. It's about halfway down. The keyboard shortcut is Command D on a Mac, Control D on a PC. Um, Shannon, did you give me a, a, a mnemonic device for that the other day? Somebody did. Was that you? Like, why isn't it Control P for place? Oh, drop. drop. Yes, thank you. My, the mnemonic device didn't work as well as I had hoped, but yes, it makes perfect sense. Drop an image in here. Drop some text in here. Thank you. Now I I'm going to write that down so that way I know it'll stick. So Command-D, think of it as drop. Or on a uh, PC, it's Control-D. We use this both for text and also for images. We do not do file, we, or we do not open a Word document and copy and paste. That is a really bad habit to get into. Do not open a Word document, select everything, and copy and paste it into InDesign. And you're going, why not? Well, if you're working with editors and things, and you're working on a, through a server, if you copy and paste from a Word document into InDesign, there is no link to that Word document. And if they're continuing to make edits on that Word document, it will not update in your InDesign because you copied and pasted from it. However, if you file in place, again, there's going to be a little bit of extra software with this. It's third-party software that they use on a server. If you go to file in place, the next time you open the InDesign document, if the editor has made edits, it will tell you, hey, the editor's made some edits. Do you want to go ahead and upload those? Again, that's third-party software. We don't have it here. But I'm letting you know you want to get in the habit of going to file and place. Command-D on a Mac, Control-D on a PC. For me, my stuff's on the desktop. If you have a flash drive, it's on your flash drive. It will be over here in the left column. It'll show a, it under devices. So you want to find your folder that you have your material in. There's mine. It says text. It started with an ox. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to hit open. And I get what is called a loaded cursor. Now watch what happens if I just click. Oh my, what a narrow column we have today. That does not read well, okay? 
Not at all. You have to be careful when you have a multi-column layout like this that if you just click and don't do anything, don't drag, it will do this. So I'm going to hit Command Z on a, Mac, on a PC that would be Control Z. If I want to have control about where this text is going and how big of a box I want to put it in, I can click and drag across however many columns I want and it will automatically put that text within that copy block. Okay. So clicking merely puts it into the columns. Clicking and dragging gives you control over how big of a copy block. Now I want to show you one more thing. I just hit Command Z. I still have my loaded cursor. Now if I'm working on multi-page documents and I, my columns are not, I can wide my columns if I want to. If I go to uh, layout and margins and columns, I can tell it to not make this a six column grid. I can go back and forth. So I go layout, margins, and columns. I'm like, you know what? I really want this to be a, a two column grid, and I'm going to hit OK. So you guys can toggle between a four column, two column, six column grid. So I will oftentimes do that when I'm bringing text in. Now, um, I also sometimes, just for fun, will also increase my top margin. Let's say I want about five inches top margin. So that would be 5in. Oh, it doesn't like that. Oh, oh, look, I have this lock checked on. Ooh, we don't want that checked on. We wanted 5 inches plus we wanted a, a half an inch uh, here. Actually, let me link it on a half an inch. Hold on, 0.5in, and I'm going to link it. There we go. Now I'm going to make sure it's unlinked and type in 5 inches at the top. Now look in the preview. I can hurry up and get all my text in and have nothing up there and then go and change that back so when I get my images I can put them in there. So you guys can change your grid up as you're working on your project. Sometimes I, to work on things efficiently and quickly I do this. So I hit OK. Now I'm going to bring my text in here and I click and it puts it in that one box. Now however, let me show you. I'm going to tighten up my top uh, margin just a little bit. Let's do 50 pikas on the top. Oh, that's too much. Okay, let's see. Let's do uh, let's do six, seven inches, seven in. There we go. So maybe I want my text going across. This is especially uh, effective in multi-page documents, where every page the text is always down there. So I have the little cursor, and I click in here, and you're like, oh, there's a little red plus sign. There's more text here. I don't. I'm too lazy, guys. I could click on the little red plus sign and come over here and get the rest of the text and punch it in there. Or, let me hit the Command Z a few times, get my cursor loaded back again. If I hold down the Shift key, I get, you'll see a little icon that pops up. It's a little arrow, a little snaky arrow. That means auto flow. If I, don't, if I hold down my Shift key and I'm trying to get text to go into multiple columns just in a snap, watch. Click, done, pay me. And if I had 100 pages in this document, it would automatically flow this into those 100 pages like that. Just by holding down the shift key when your cursor is loaded. So you can turn hours of hard labor where you can have a much more, uh, a larger percentage of uh, where you might make a mistake, a larger chance of making a mistake by not doing the shift thing. Or it will do it exactly right and flow to every one of those 100 pages in the right order in a matter of a split second. And it will be absolutely 100% accurate. So do you guys, how many of you guys think uh, your time is valuable? Most of you think it is. Would you like to work harder or smarter? I just taught you smarter. I just shared with you smarter. I showed you harder at first. But smarter? I'd rather go to the movies tonight, wouldn't you? If I don't know this stuff, I'm here for hours and I miss my date at the movies. I have to stay here till 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock at night because I don't really know how to work smarter. So work smarter, not harder. Now what I would do is I would go back to my layout and margins and columns, and I would go back to making this a three pica layout with six columns, and guess what? My type stays exactly where it was when I placed it. This is called efficiency. 
It took me years of working in desktop publishing to figure this out. I was there, girl, and just like any young person going out there, just new in the world, I wasn't taught this stuff. I had to figure it out myself. And I was working till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, a lot of times, linking text boxes from one page to another of a hundred and some odd page document. Life sucked. All I needed to know was hold down the shift key, modify the, modify the grid, tell it where the text needs to go, use the shift key, and I would have been done in less than five minutes. So I just turned a five hour job into less than five minutes. And when you guys go get employment, you can thank me later. Because it is worth it. All right. Now, we can still move these around. You're like, oh, you know what? I want this to be over here, and I want this to be over here. You know, I want to kind of cross over like this. You know, this is where you can start playing around with it. You can still adjust these if you decide, oh, that's too wide. I want to bring it over here. Or you're like, I'm going to get rid of them all together. I'm going to do it all in one column. You know, more power to you. You just click on these nodes and move them. This is, we oftentimes call this the little window shade puller. But these are anchor points or nodes. You just move them around until you get what you want. Now, I do have a headline, it's called, it started with an ox, I need to get that out of there. He should be in a whole separate text box. Since this is more like a small poster design, I'm not gonna have him link up to the other text. So let me teach you about, uh, or share with you, uh, again, more efficiency things. Let's talk about clicking. Something as simple as clicking. If I single click, my cursor is there and it's blinking and it's saying, hey, thanks. That means I could type something in there. If I double click, it's going to select just the word. If I triple click, it selects the entire line. What happens when I click four times? One, two, three, four. It grabs the whole paragraph. Let me go into a paragraph. One, or, well, there was two clicks. One, two, three clicks. One, two, three, four clicks grabs the whole paragraph. And one, two, three, four, five clicks grabs the whole story. Now, to grab the whole story, just hit Command A. Five clicks takes longer than Command A. So I don't use five clicks very often. Four clicks, however, I do use fairly often, and three clicks for sure if I'm grabbing the whole line. Three clicks are probably my most often used number of clicks. Handy, huh? How many guys knew that? I, oh, you're getting your money's worth today. The $19 you paid for this particular class today, you are getting your money's worth. All right, so I three clicks on my headline, and I hit Command X. Command X means cut. It's under edit, cut. Cut means take it out and delete it, but keep it in the memory so we can paste it later, okay? So Control X or Command X. I can then grab the type tool and draw a type box, and then hit Command V, as in victory, or edit, paste, and there he is. Now it looks like he's got an extra return there. I'm gonna delete that. There we go. My headline is separate from my body copy. Not a bad idea. I can deal with that more artistically that way. Now, let's talk about the body copy. I loaded Helvetica. I want it to be Helvetica new. So, I can either do five clicks and get the whole story or hit Command A and I can tell it, hey, this needs to be Helvetica. Where do we do that? Well, up here on the control panel, you can see that there's a font, point size, letting, and a type style. Now there's also a little, and that's under the character formatting, that's the little A. If you're in the P area, that's paragraph formatting. That's about line, that's about how far it indents, uh, the first line, that's how much space between the paragraphs, those kinds of things. So you have to toggle between the A and the backwards P. Paragraph formatting, character formatting. Times New Roman, mm -mm -mm, that's not one of the fonts. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna highlight Times New Roman. It's in blue right now. And I'm gonna start typing in the word Helvetica. Helvetica, there it is. But it is the right, is it the right Helvetica? We have a lot of Helvetica. Now if you see TT, we don't really load true type fonts. They're already preloaded, they came free with the software. They are a lesser grade font than font file, font software, than the open type. Open type are uber professional. Not nearly the problems, you won't have nearly problems with open type. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the O. 
And we're also looking for the little STD because the Helvetica NU that I loaded was Helvetica NU LT, which is for linotype foundry, foundry, and the STD for standard. So I'm like, okay, let's see. This is body copy, and I want a Helvetica NU. Gosh, there's so many in Helvetica NU. Let me just do a Helvetica me uh, NU medium. I might condense it a little bit. It's a little wide for me. So let me go and find. Oh, now if I click on the style right here, it's number 65 medium right here. See, before it was here in the font, but here I'm going to go down here to the style, and now I'm going to find a Helvetica, maybe medium condensed. Let's see if they have it. Oh, they have a light condensed. They have just a regular condensed, which is probably more of a medium. Oh, there it is, medium condensed. Ah, there we go. For me, that looks to me maybe a little bit better than the wider one for just my own personal, that's my own personal taste. So you change the font by choosing it here. Again, if you just click in there, it turns blue and start typing in the font. If I wanted to, uh, let's say Optima, it's, there it is. I start typing Optima and look, it gives me all the Optimas that are loaded. Oh, those are true types. Those aren't really good. I better load some good Optima. I want to see an O there. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about paragraph formatting real quick too. Lots of things with paragraph formatting you guys probably are not aware of. So here I'm going to click on the backwards P. <clears throat> Do you see that big whopper wide indent right there? That is huge mongus. That is uncomfortable. That is like, whoa, who decided that? Well, Microsoft Word did because it's a Microsoft product and it's clunky. They don't care about design too much. So I need to, first of all, select all of this text and tell it, hey, you know, your first line indent is a little much. Where is the first line indent? Well, let's look up here in these little icons. If I float my cursor over the icon, that tells me it's just a left indent. That's the whole paragraph. The next one says first line left indent. It's a half an inch. That is whopper, folks. Whopper. Typically, one pica, one P, is plenty. One pica left indent. That's more than enough. In fact, you don't even need to do a left indent if you're doing space between the paragraphs. So this is an option. And there is a space between the paragraphs. It's not because I hit the cursor and went return, return, return. Actually, that's a no-no now that you guys are learning real things, the real deal. So how do I know there's no return there? Well, you can go to type and you can go to the bottom and show hidden characters. If there's no backwards P parked in here, then nobody hit the return key extra times there. In other words, double spacing. They didn't hit what's called a hard return. But if you see a backwards P in there, in the middle, that means somebody hit the return key twice to get the double spacing. No, no, no. No more. You guys are going to be professionals now. Okay? We're raising you right. How do we get the space between the paragraphs then? Well, first off, let's examine the letting before we do anything. Right now, this typeface is 12 point over 14. I need to make sure that I'm using a decent typeface size. Helvetica has a large X height, so I might go a little smaller on Helvetica, such as 10 or 11 points. I'll go 11. The letting typically is about two point sizes larger than the font. When the letting, which is right underneath the type size, when the letting has parentheses around it, that means it's auto letting. Never let the computer make choices for you. Auto let, even if you like that letting, type in 13.2 if that's what you want. Um, Helvetica has shorter uh, descenders where the P's come down and the Y's come down. So Helvetica, um, it could probably use maybe a little less letting than normal. So I'm going to do 11 over 12. What you want is not, you don't want uh, your D senders touching your A senders. Like here, where the G and the P, the capital P, or the lowercase P and the uppercase, or lowercase T, you just don't want things touching. That would look bad. By the way, when I zoom out, I hit Command and the number zero. And then with the zoom tool, if I want to zoom into an area, I click and drag over that area, and it zooms right to the area I clicked and dragged in. Okay? 
And to zoom out slightly, I hit Command minus. On a PC, of course, this would be Control zero to zoom, to get the full window. Control minus to zoom in or to zoom out. Control or Command plus to zoom in, and so on. Now. So we just specified a point size and, and the letting. The letting amount is important to us in regards to spacing between the paragraphs. If you want to double space, it's going to be the same number as the letting. So let me go to the backwards P. Over here, if I float my cursor, it says space after. That means space after paragraph. So in that area right now, it says P10. If I put a P12, 12 points, that is equal to the letting amount. Typically, the space after a paragraph is equal to the letting amount. That way, if I have a couple of columns of text, they will align well to one another instead of like one of them looking like it's kicked down a little bit. Okay. Now, I'm going to increase the point size of this for just a minute because I want to create hyphens on purpose. I want to show you something. Hyphens are the work of Beazelbub. You do not want hyphen, by the way, that's the devil. Uh, you do not want hyphens in your work, unless you're working for the newspaper, they love them, they don't care. But in your professional work, in all your stuff you're do doing for school, whether it's a website design, your business card, a newsletter, a pamphlet to promote yourself, hyphens need to go. And what's worse than a hyphen is a stacked hyphen, which I don't see them here. A stacked hyphen is a hyphen here and one right next to it, right, right underneath it. Oh, you have that in your portfolio and people will be like, oh my Lord, did you not go to Ivy Tech? Did Rebecca not teach you? You must have not taken classes from Rebecca. She would never let you have hyphens in your stuff. And we don't want hyphens in your stuff either. Shame on you, what are you doing with all your hyphens? So let's unhyphenate real quick. Let's, get, let's kill the hyphens. It is so, so simple. We just have to go through and find this like Toucan Sam secret decoder button and go dig for it. Now they put the button right here. Look at that. In the backwards P, the, the, the paragraph formatting controls, you have the word hyphenate and it is by default checked on. Guess what? Select the text, uncheck it, no hyphens. Yay! No hyphens. I'm going to go back and make this 11 points. Now we do have what's called widowed text down here, which um, both of these are little uh, poor widows. Uh, they're separated from the rest of the text. Now orphan text is a whole other thing. Let me talk about widows and orphans real quick. Um, if you have a couple of, excuse me, columns of text and let me discuss the difference between orphans and widows. Yes. Uh, I don't know. No, it's not this one. It's the one uh, two doors down. The Mac there. Yeah. Sorry, we had some IT problems. A little interruption there. This is orphan text. Now, widows can manage, right? Widows are grown women. If their husband dies, it's very sad. It's horrible. But they, they can manage still on their own. Orphans, on the other hand, that's more extreme, yes? So look, that's more extreme. Poor orphan. Poor widows. So here I have an orphan up there and a widow down there. Widows are excessively short lines of text at the end of a paragraph. And I know this sounds brutal, but we kill them all. We kill the widows and we kill the orphans. Yes, kill them all. How do you do that? Well, sometimes I get with my editor and we rewrite a little bit. We put a little fluff and stuff or we take out a little fluff and stuff. But oftentimes you don't have the luxury of doing that. So I might use a slightly different column width and design a little differently if I'm having problems with widows and orphans. There we go. Widow's gone. Well, he's not. Now he's about half the length of this. It's not as noticeable. It's still kind of a widow, but not as bad. So I just killed my widows and killed my orphans. I know, Trent, he's looking back there going, she's killing widows and orphans? She's just so mean. Yes, slay them all. Okay. You guys learning some things today? Quite a bit, I imagine. We just placed text. Now we placed it in the wrong layer, however. Darn it. I'm always in the wrong layer. Always. Well, how do we get this to the right layer? If I click on it, you'll see a little 
the little uh, square lights up. That says, hey, you're on this layer. If I click on the headline, hey, you're on that layer. If I click on the other type, you're on that layer. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to select. This is multiple selections. I hold down the shift key. I select each one of those boxes. I could also hit command A because that's the only thing I have on my layout. But if I had images and stuff, I'd probably do the shift clicking thing. And this little square next to the word, you know, the background layer with the little thing, it indicates that these selected items are on this layer. And it tells me right there, it gives me a hint, drag that to the layer you want to it to be on. So if I click on this little square and I go, oh, you're supposed to go up here to the text type layer, and I drag it up there, oh, guess what? Now it's on the text type layer. In fact, I'll turn it off and on, and you can see that's how that works. Totally different than Photoshop, folks. Very different from Photoshop. Now, it's similar in Photoshop that you can click on the arrow and you can see what different things are there but it is different in how you manage bringing it from one layer to the other. Okay? So now it's on the text layer. Of course, you can lock the layer just as you could in Photoshop. Between the eyeball and the name of it, you click there, there's a little lock that comes up. Now, Photoshop, you actually have to click on a lock in the upper area. So these locks just are kind of, they're hidden until you click there, and you're like, oh, there's the locking area. So if you want to lock it and have it not be moved or anything, of course I can zoom in, but I can't move it or anything. That's how you do that. So I'm going to unlock that layer. You guys want to know the sneakiest awesome secret in the world? This is I'm about ready to show you such a time saver on how to resize text like that. And do it so it's more of an intuitive sort of thing. Do it till it looks right. Do it till it fits perfectly within the guide, you know, the, 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 the grid structure that you're working on. So first off, I'm going to do this with a headline. So let me go ahead and make this flush left. And uh, right now it's centered. So if I go to the backwards P, you'll see we have all these alignments. Here's left, here's center, here's right, and I never use that one. Here's justified with last line left. I never use justify with last line center. I don't even know why they invented it. And I don't use force justify. Force justify spreads everything out. That looks dumb. So I don't use that. I don't use this. I, I've never used those two ever. So it's left, center, right, or justify with the last line left. Now, there's a really cool thing if you guys are keyboard shortcut junkies. If I select this text and I hit command C, or I'm sorry, shift command C, shift command C, Center. On the PC, that'd be shift Control c So I don't even need to open up that paragraph formatting window. So if shift Control c is center, what do you think left align is? shift Control what? shift Control l Oh, good guess. What do you think right is? shift Control r Oh, look at that. Justified. shift Control j It'll just go to the left right now but because it's not a paragraph. But let me, let me choose uh, this. Let me show you Justified. Let's select all of this, and if I hit shift Control r it all goes to the right. If I hit shift Control l whoops, not K, that's caps. shift Control l it goes to the left. shift Control c makes it centered. shift Control or Command on a, P, on a Mac. shift Control or Command, what am I doing? Justified? J. There's Justified. Justified saves a lot of space. That's why the newspapers use it. It squishes certain things together. See how that line came over here? And you're like, whoa, he was over there on the other ones. Justified copy uses less, gets more characters per line most of the time. But I want shift control L or shift command L. Now let's go back to this headline. You guys ready for the magic? This is where it really, really starts. I'm going to close the layers panel for just a minute. Now let's say I wanted this to get big real quick and I wanted it to end right about there. Whoa, you're going, how did you do that? Let me slow it down a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. This time I'm actually going to do it so I can see it doing it. Oh, look, instead of just the box. Oh, I need that ox to go right to about to that purple line. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Pay me. You guys want to know this, don't you? I'm like, oh, let's see. I think I need to make that smaller. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, and this is somebody standing on my shoulder. Hey, can you make that three columns wide? Yeah, sure. There you go. Done. Like that. You guys want that, right? Or do you want to labor over it? I'll let you labor over it. Now, how I'm doing that, and this works on both PC and Mac. First, I'm with the 
black arrow tool known as the selection tool. Not the type tool, selection tool. I am selecting the type the, that the box is in. So I'm not selecting the actual type, I'm selecting, selecting the box. Basically, we're worried about the bounding box. You might want to tighten those boxes up a little bit so they're not like, basically you don't want a box out here like this with only that much type in it. That's kind of goofy and you start to have problems with that later. So tighten up your boxes so they're about as big as your text. I'm holding down on a Mac, shift command. I am not doing anything with my mouse yet, but shift and command. And then I click and I wait. I'm clicking on a node, a corner node, and I'm waiting. And then I can click and drag. Then I keep on there and I'm dragging. I'm like, whoa, look at that. I can see it happening. And I'm going to hit command Z. If I hold down shift and command, I click and just start dragging. You notice that the box gets bigger, but I can't see what's happening. But then when I let off, it makes it bigger. So if you guys want to see it live, you hold down shift to command. On a PC, this would be shift and control. And you click, you wait just a couple seconds, and then you start dragging. You can see it happening live. For most people, they prefer that because they don't want to have to do this two or three times to get it right. That works for all text. If I grab both of these text boxes, you know, I just click and drag right over them and grab it. This is called contact sensitive. I click in some place that doesn't have any images or anything, I drag over them, it grabs both of them. That keeps me from having to go click, shift, click again, great, it saves time. It, this works on these as well as the big ones. So I'm holding down shift and command, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna make these text boxes bigger as well. It does increase the text within them as well. Now, oftentimes we don't really want our body copy this big. It works for images. If I place an image, I can do this as well. Smaller or bigger. How cool is that? It's going to save you guys a lot of time. Shift command, click, wait, and then start dragging. Shift control on a PC, click, wait, then start dragging so you can see it live. Okay. I think I'm going to stop this video and um, because these are going to be pretty long if I don't. And we'll take a break. And I'll save the video and try to export it and upload. These take a while. I'll try to do this during break. And then we'll start a new video on putting images in and working with images and even manipulating type a little bit more. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay, so let's take about a 15-minute break. Come back at a little after quarter till. So I guess come back at 10 till 3. And we'll pick back up on some InDesign stuff. Okay.